Thank you. Yeah, please sit down. It's. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. It's really nice to see everyone. I was uh, with, sitting with my wife, listening to Rick, and she, she was commenting. Goes, how can I remember all those numbers, all those games, all those people, all those days? I said, it's 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 baseball. <laughs> The, um, I wrote down uh, what I wanted to say because I didn't want to get this wrong. I was, uh, was also, nobody told me how many people would be here. <laughs> but uh, it is really nice to see everyone. And these are my thoughts for you and, and for, uh, for this evening. I finished them as I was getting out of the car here. Uh, it's already been a long night and my intention is not to make it any longer. But now that I am up here, and I, I can't help but find myself thinking about John Lennon's song, In My Life. I think it's one of the most beautiful songs that was ever written. The opening line, I think a lot of us know, is there are places I remember. That line's been chasing me all week, as has a uh, and it's followed me now up to the podium. I was 17 when I moved to Orange County. I, I was in my senior year. I was going on my fourth school in as many years. The year was 1973, and I was wondering if my lottery number was going to send me to Vietnam. But I was fortunate. The draft was terminated. 56,000 Americans weren't. Mostly men in their teens and early 20s that never came home from a war that somehow still haunts us in some way. Hundreds of thousands more came home bent and broken. And I often think of them, and I find myself thinking of, about how many of them played baseball. How many must have had the same dreams as you? Maybe the same talent as you? Maybe some of them were better than you, but they never got the chance. I think about their parents and what they would have given to see their sweet boys play just one more time. One of the best parts the baseball has always been about being able to look up into the stands and see your mom and dad. Don't take it for granted. I didn't, and if you watch closely in For Love of the Game, you'll see mine waving to me. So parents, make sure you come to see them play. Find a way to travel. Find a way to be there. Find a way to be there when your sons look up, and not just when things are going well. This is your time as well. A quick snapshot of the world that I was trying to define myself and determined to live in in 1973 saw The Godfather II capturing its second Oscar for Best Picture, the Oakland A's in their white shoes, winning their third World Series in a row. And a weary nation was watching as a disgraced president was forced from office. My own personal confidence was at an all-time low. My choices were limited. I had three. I could either follow some kids that I barely knew to Santa Ana College. I could find a job, or I could maybe go to this state college that someone mentioned. They said it was next to the 57. <laughs> I asked what exit, but they didn't know. <laughs> they said I couldn't miss it. There weren't any trees and the buildings were all cement. They were right. There weren't any trees. There wasn't any ivy. This wasn't a school that made Playboy's list for best cheerleaders. It's nice to see what's happening these days. <laughs> People, and it's, a, it's an absolute fact that people didn't even refer to Fullerton as a college back then. It was called a commuter school. 
And if I signed up early, the tuition would be 99 bucks. <laughs> That's right, $99. The only thing I really loved was baseball, but I was at the end of the road athletically. The only thing I thought I knew how to do was to tell stories, and my father was pretty sure that that wasn't even a job. <laughs> I had no roots and I had no direction. I certainly didn't have the grades. All I had to do was get 99 bucks. <laughs> it turned out the books would cost more. <laughs> it wasn't hard. In fact, the hardest thing about going to Cal State Fullerton for me or for anyone in 1973 was finding a parking spot. <laughs> I'm trying to get at something here. I'm trying to get at something, and if you think I'm taking a long, long time, then you should try watching one of my movies. <laughs> I'm trying to get at something as I look out at the guys who played here, as well as our newest and current players. What I'm, like, what I'm getting at, what I want you to know, is that when people around the country connect me to the Fullerton baseball program, the first and saddest thing I have to let them know is that I was never one of you. <laughs> I wasn't that good. What I want you to know is that the program built here by Augie Garrido and George Horton and Dave Serrano and now Rick Vanderhoek is so important to me. It's so sacred that to pretend otherwise would be the worst kind of betrayal to any player who was ever good enough to wear the Titan jersey. So how, how could I have so much pride about a program that I never played a part in? The answer is simple. It was Augie. He made me feel important. He made me feel like I was part of the team and he made the team feel the same way. It's why I think so much of George Horton, who did the same in making me a part of everything in infusing this mystical bond when he could have just as easily let that tradition go, let that just be Augie's thing, move on. I wish I could tell him tonight. I wish I could thank David for allowing me to share and bask in the reflected glory of the players and the program they brought to this school. It's why I felt moved when Rick asked me to come and speak. I've never assumed I've never assumed what my place is with Fullerton, with the Fullerton program. I know how I feel, but I've never wanted, I've never wanted that relationship to be taken for granted. All over the country, I'm asked to work out with major league baseball teams, and I continue to be flattered by that. And I understand it's because of the three movies, but just like Fullerton, <laughs> I never, I never say yes because the school administration may want it to happen. I never say yes because the big league ownership would like to see me out there on the field. It's not a photo op for me. The game and the players all mean too much for me to think that celebrity gives me some kind of pass that allows me to step on their field. I only consider it when I know that it's coming from the coaches and I only consider it when I know when the players feel the same way. In 1999, Fullerton was asked to play the Anaheim Angels just before their season opener. What a thrill it was for our team and a clear sign of the growing respect Fullerton was experiencing here and around the country. It would be our players' chance to measure themselves against the pros. It would maybe, be, it would maybe stand as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for our team. So when George, George Horton asked me to play with the team that day, I asked him two questions. Was it all right with the players? Was it all right with the coaches? George knew what I was asking and he found a way to make me feel okay. And the players also found a way. And 20,000 people came to watch us play. 
I got to play the whole game at short. I even made a few plays. <laughs> I think I even managed to take a ball in the hole. <laughs> I'm not saying the deep hole, <laughs> but it was in the hole. I had to backhand it to throw the guy out. <laughs> Being cheered was something to be remembered. Dropping a fly ball that I think cost us the game <laughs> and having those same 20,000 people boo <laughs> also sticks out. But having George come out onto the field and wave me off short in the ninth inning, just like Little League to come pitch, was something that I will never forget. But the biggest thing that happened in an already big day, the thing that sticks out the most for me, the thing that I'm still haunted by, is that somebody had to sit in order for me to play. A Fullerton player, more deserving, more talented, didn't get his chance, maybe his only chance, to play in the major leagues that day. It's not a small thing that I'm talking about. It's a big thing. It's a sacrifice. It's a dream that all the players in this room have had. Not everyone makes it to the promised land. Cal State Fullerton has sent 59 players to the big leagues. I think about 12 of them are in the room. You know, but there's something all the players in this room have in common. You've pretty much all been the best player on whatever team you've ever played. The best player in your league. It's doubtful enough of you were ever asked to play right field. <laughs> For you, the game, the gifted ones, it's, the game has always been easy. This is a room full of players that never sat on the bench. But that day is coming. You're now in a room. You're now on a team that represents the best of the best and only nine get to be on the field. So what are you gonna do, and you know who I'm talking to, when you're not one of the nine? You came to Cal State to play baseball and presumably get an education. Well, this is where it begins. Some of you are going to have to deal with it for the very first time. Your parents are going to have to deal with it for the very first time. For the first time, baseball is going to be hard. The question is, what are you going to do? You can pout. You can call home. You can find a place on the bench where you're sure the coach can see how upset you are. Your teammates can see how upset you are. All I want you to know tonight, all I want you to be sure of, is that you were brought here to Fullerton for a reason. It wasn't an accident that you're here. You were brought here to play because of your character and because of your talent. The best player, the best player I ever played against was Jim Irvine. I don't know where you're at in the room, Jim, but I saw you walking around. Jim Irvine was the best player I ever played against, and I already told you I moved a lot, so I lost track of Jim and found out in my first year that he was here. He was at Fullerton. I didn't know him really that well. He was older. I thought about looking him up, but like I said, Mike, Confidence was at an all-time low. I did take the time, however, more than once to quietly stand and watch the team play. The team was better than the field they played on. But one day I couldn't find Jim. Jim wasn't on the field. Jim was on the bench. I thought, shit, this isn't right. <laughs> 
And I can bet you $10,000 Jim thought it wasn't right. <laughs> but there he was. We were losing. So when Augie told him to get a bat, I could see he still wasn't happy. But he got up, he got a bat, and he stepped into the box. He took the first couple of pitches on a really cold day. Then he stepped out to look at Augie. There was no expression. When Jim step, stepped back in, he knocked the next pitch over the fucking wall. <laughs> He knocked it over the fence that didn't have a single sponsor's name on it. <laughs> the team was happy, but Jim never smiled, never looked once at Augie as he rounded the bases, never looked at him when he came back into the dugout. Thirty years later, I asked Augie about that obscure game, and just like a baseball man, he remembered every bit of it and smiled, taking in the moment. So the question is, what are you going to do when it's your chance? to come off the bench. Augie told me Jim was one of the cornerstones in the building of this program, but he still had him sit. I can't think of a higher compliment, cornerstone, or better example to the young players to trust your talent, trust your coaches, trust that you're here for a reason, and I promise you will get your chance. Some of you will even make it to the big leagues. And when you do, your fellow Titans will experience two emotions. The first will be that they're jealous as hell that it wasn't them. <laughs> but the second, of course, will be pride. It will be pride that they once played with you. Pride that they coached you. Like the pride we had watching Justin just single-handedly beat the Mets up. A team that let him go. <laughs> this program wanted to be about something, and now it is. So it matters to us how you conduct yourself. It matters to us how you practice. The little things matter to us because it's how we win here. We are known around the country as a baseball school with a really big parking lot. <laughs> a really big parking lot that likes to bunt. We're a team that knows how to bunt. It's a skill set that 59 of our best players have taken with them into the big leagues. And nobody likes to play us. Nobody wants to play us in the big game. We expect a lot of you and the teams that will follow. And hopefully we're showing you that by being here tonight and supporting Rick and his coaching staff. My stories may seem like they're all about baseball, but they're not all about the game. The men who coach here are winners. They know that losing is a part of the game, but find it almost impossible to accept. It's the DNA of a winner. But life is bigger, and in 2004, in a game, in a game everyone remembers, Cal State Fullerton played the University of Texas for the national championship. <laughs> Augie would be coaching against his former player and assistant. They would be playing for all of the marbles against our beloved George Horton. It was a moment that stood still for all of us. Not the world, mind you, but for college baseball, the table was set like a Hollywood movie. For most of you, it was no problem in knowing who to root for. The Beach Boys said it pretty well. Be true to your school. But it didn't make it any easier for me. And I was torn that day, to be sure. Baseball can be cruel, and that day would be the greatest example, as I knew that one of my friend's hearts would be on the ground. Fullerton won its fourth national championship that day, 
and Augie la lost a chance at winning his fifth. I was happy for our school, but I was secretly worried about their friendship. How would they be able to talk? Would they ever be able to talk? Three months later, I married Christine, who also went to Fullerton. We were married at my ranch in Colorado. I built a baseball field in the middle of the Rockies and put up lights to make sure we never had to stop. <laughs> both men were invited, and both of them came out of respect for me and Chris. It couldn't have been easy. Three hours before we were married, we had an epic baseball game at 9,000 feet. <laughs> it was a magical moment, and everyone played. Everyone played, that is, except for Augie and George, who somehow made their way into left field. Neither had a glove. I don't know who made the first move. It doesn't matter, really, because they were standing, talking, both watching the game together with hands in pockets that they knew so well. They were far enough away to know that no one could have known what was said, and I never asked. But magic happened that day in left field, and the Fullerton family became one again. The game ended because Chris said it had to. <laughs> we were all dirty, and we all had to quick find showers, then hustle back so that we could get married. Chris asked if it was always gonna be this way. And I said, I hope so. That was a great day. So let me finish by telling you about another. It's something I experience and have come to expect almost every time I step on a major league field when one of the players I'm standing next to ask, you played for Fullerton, didn't you? <laughs> when it happens, I have two distinct feelings. The first is the pride I feel for how far we've come as a program. The second is always my embarrassment that I have to say, no, I never did. What's worse, what's worse is the embarrassment I see in the player for having asked, and the disappointment that what they thought we had in common had somehow faded. And I can honestly see a disappointment creep until I casually remind them that I did pitch a perfect game at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> And that Vin Scully called it, which seems to suddenly count for a lot. <laughs> and if for whatever reason that doesn't put us on a level, field, a, a level playing field, I remind them that I was in the bathtub with Susan Sarandon, <laughs> which suddenly seems to count for everything. <laughs> but there's one thing, but there's one thing that always There's one thing that always gets me, and it usually happens when it gets the most quiet, and the player and I are just settled in, taking balls at short. It's a simple confession that seems to come out of nowhere, and often it doesn't come out easy. It's almost a whisper when they stop and tell me that the first time they ever saw their dad cry it was when they watched Field of Dreams together. <laughs> Baseball is a simple game, but what happens on the field sometimes can take your breath away. Looking out at our former players tonight and our 
faithful alumni, our boosters, the parents who will support their sons. It's important for me to say, I was never as good as any of you, and I have never pretended that I was. I am thankful and I am comfortable with my place in our collective history. I had no upside when I came to Fullerton, but neither did Fullerton. <laughs> I came because there was nowhere else for me to go. <laughs> but I came tonight because of Rick Vanderhoek. I came tonight, Rick, because I was moved to know that you were willing to keep this chain unbroken. Thank you, Coach. So, tomorrow we play, right? Yeah. Right, I plan to suit up. And uh, even though I'm 61 years old, I ask no favor. I don't want anyone holding back, all right? I want everything on a level playing field. Fair enough? Yeah. Fair enough? Good. But I swear to God, <laughs> if any one of you pitchers come close to me, <laughs> if you hit me, or you hit anyone on my team, <laughs> I will descend on you and on this institution. <laughs> so tomorrow we play, tomorrow we play on a field that is level and carefully raked by someone we'll never see, <laughs> with a fence that is now filled with sponsors, with an outfield and a wall backed by flags that boast our four national championships, with lights that will let us play as long as we want, and white balls that the program can now afford to lose. <laughs> Tomorrow, we turn the clock back and I consider it a personal honor that you've asked me here tonight. And I consider it a personal honor that you will allow me tomorrow to step on your field of dreams. Thank you. Thank you so much. They say in showbiz.